So we'll go into the relationship between uh, wiring diagrams and dynamical systems at the very highest level. I recognize that you haven't had a chance to review the source material here. Um, polynomial functors course from Topos lecture four. And um, therefore I'm not going to you know, be relying uh, heavily on it, um, but rather uh, I'll talk a, a little bit about where this fits in. So you know, last time I, I made the point that while um, when you first approach this material, it can seem kind of arcane and, and puzzling or arbitrary. Um, if, you, if you start looking beyond the, the detailed little rules that you got to keep track of, you'll actually see some broad patterns. And the broad patterns um, are, are ones that allow enormous flexibility and in, in combining together um, these mappings, mappings that could represent dynamical systems amongst other applications in really beautiful modular ways. Um, and you know, co-product and product and tensor product and this composition are, are all in, all, all examples of that. Um, it's 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 quite beautiful, and they're uh, transformable and and they're composable. You can substitute these in, and and um, what we're going to see though uh, is is with the uniting them with wiring diagrams takes that to another level. Um, and, uh, and specifically it, it adds this kind of declarative component of this, this very visual component that I think uh, really recommends them. And it's, it's not only visual, it's not merely kind of eye candy illustrating the structure you have your choice of kind of reasoning in the wiring diagram in a way that can be very insightful uh, about the nature of the mappings you're dealing with. And you can use wiring diagrams to advance your thinking very actively. Uh, and as we saw from symmetric monodal categories, uh, the use of these symmetric monodal categories is designed so that the ambiguities in the wiring diagram don't matter. They are they're moot um, because the either ambiguous way to read it, to interpret it, gives the same result. Um, and, and so wiring diagrams will turn into this, one of this really useful ways of kind of approaching these reasoning about it and will then support further, um, taking this further yet with dynamical systems for reasoning about their behavior. Um, and about how the behaviors combine as we combine systems, how the modes combine, um, and things like fixed points of the system combine in structured ways uh, when you combine the, the, the systems together, such as in a wiring diagram. Um, and this will be done in a way that's uh, hierarchical, and um, you can substitute one is into another, have one as a subsystem of, of another, et cetera. Um, and it's, it's all, you know, extraordinarily elegant. Um, so all this builds on this notion of dynamical systems is, is being characterized as mappings uh, between morphisms. And with wiring diagrams, we're going to be particularly focused on dynamical systems with just a single mode of operation. In the book, there's actually a mention of, you know, like switching suppliers and it's shown in a kind of wiring diagram metaphor where you switch from one supplier to another because you have a, too many defective widgets or whatever. And um, I suppose one could do something like that, uh, but, um, but here we're dealing with wiring diagrams to illustrate systems with just a single mode. And they can be translated into a, simple map, not simple a map, uh, between monomials. Um, and on the left-hand side for wiring diagrams for dynamical systems, we're going to have something of the form S-Y to the S. Uh, so 
uh, wiring diagrams uh, are going to allow us to characterize the relationship between subsystems and outer systems, sort of the systems within to the systems outside. Um, and this is actually from David Jess Meyer's talk uh, that we'll be getting to 6.5. But um, this relationship between the two, the inner boxes to the outer boxes, uh, allows some very simple operations, swapping, projecting, where you forget about one thing and you continue the others and sort of splitting or, or sort of diagonalization where it goes to multiple, uh, a given wire goes to multiple places. And wiring diagrams can be captured in symbolic notation. Um, so they kind of map into symbolic notation. And the symbolic notation is easy enough that after watching lecture four, you should be able to read off, you know, what is, what is the formula or the equation um, and characterized by a diagram like this. By glancing at it, you could say, okay, this is B times Y to the AC, because these two are inputs and this is the output. Um, and these two are tensored together because they run concurrently. There's coupling between them, but they run concurrently. And they lead to an overall thing where it's D out in A in, and hence something like this. So the wiring diagrams wire up or, or specify this relationship between the subsystem and the outer system in a way that can be mapped into symbolic notation. Um, and it turns out there's somewhat different distinctions, um, different distinctions are captured in wiring diagrams and in the symbolic notation. Um, and so in the wiring diagram, we can actually disambiguate things that are not obvious from kind of the, the symbolic uh, characterization of the, um, the, the, the types involved in the mappings. And we can substitute in one for another in this uh, hierarchical way, in a way that they compose. And we can collapse that composition and um, consider everything at the lowest level. As David Spivak said, it's like you have a computer and that has you know cards in it and a motherboard and those have subsystems associated with uh, you know, the, the, the video machinery and the IO machinery uh, for the IO ports and the graphics, uh, the, uh, the thing to deal with um, power supply and things to deal with um, the, uh, the, the mechanisms for um, engaging in uh, GPU computation and for memory. And then you can break those down yet further and you could compose all of them. You could represent that in a wiring diagram. And by, by considering the composition, uh, you could create a wiring diagram. It's just transistors uh, at, you know, mapping to the highest level by collapsing all these levels down. Um, now, David Jazz Myers has emphasized that these diagrams, although we'll be using them for set, they can be used with any Cartesian category, he says, or I think it may be Cartesian closed category, so we can represent exponentials. Um, and he does some really cool stuff with combining some of this with monadic uh, computations. Um, uh, so, so these wiring diagrams um, have this structure to it we can, uh, we can capture. Um, it's they characterize simple diagrams. You're not going to represent a modal system like a, um, a more complex, uh, what David calls uh, interaction protocol with the wiring diagram alone. You're going to need, uh, so I think like a Turing machines operation, you're going to need something more than a, a wiring diagram. Um, uh, right, so um, here, uh, all of this is going to be linked in with the mechanisms we've been dealing with for mapping polynomials. Uh, and uh, we'll see that 
you know, if we have two subsystems within an overall system, we take the tensor product of these subsystems, regardless whether they're coupled one way or bidirectionally, we take their tensor product. And so um, the, we could consider each of them as a dynamical system. So this one here has output B and input A, and this one, the, uh, sorry, and, and on the left-hand side as a dynamical system, we have something of S wide at the S. This one here, similarly, is a dynamical system, T wide of the T, at a some internal state T, just like this is some internal state S, but its output is D and its input is C. Okay, so that's, that's kind of nice, but by virtue of being here within the same overall box, we tensor them. We, they operate concurrently. And so by tensoring these, we tensor the left-hand sides. That's this one, S y to the S tensor, T y to the T. And then we tensor the right-hand sides, these guys, uh, B y to the A tensor, D y to the C. And just taking this, that turns into S T y to the S T. In short, the state space of this of, of this entire diagram encompassing of both of these is just the product of the state space of, of these diagrams within it. Uh, and so we, you know, we could deal with one where this is in this state S, S zero and this is in state you know, T zero or what have you, um, little lowercase s, uh, lowercase t. Uh, and the output from the system is just, well, the output is just B times D. We get all combinations of Bs and Ds uh, that in principle we could get. And A and Cs are the input, A times Cs. So from a subsystems, we can go to the overall system. And uh, when we have coupled systems, the same thing is true. We, we still, we still tensor them. Um, and uh, David Spivak, you know, comments that in some sense, this system on the left is, um, is easier to read, but it's the same connectivity as the system on the right. Um, and, you know, looking at this, it's, it's very obvious a tensor relationship. However it's drawn, it's a tensor relationship. And uh, what we have here is, is a dynamical system consisting of these subsystems tensored together, um, each with a certain output and a certain input. That's where the A is the input to this guy. The B is the output. That's tensored with this one here. Um, this is a symmetric monoidal category. So you could go in either order, tensor them in either order. Uh, you don't have to pick them only in, in one order. Um, but this entire thing is a mapping from this to, to this. This is just a mapping of polynomial functors. And, uh, and that represents on the right-hand side kind of the interface to the outer thing. So we can think of these as like interfaces. Um, so the output of B and an input of A, output of D and an input of C. And then we get, by combining them and you know, an interface for the entirety with B and D as output and A and C as input. Um, here we have B, uh, B is the only output. And you'll notice that there's this Y here and um, you might think it's Y to the zero because there's no inputs, but it turns out it's Y to the one because the inputs and the outputs are like products of sets. Um, and uh, coefficients, the exponents here are all products. And when we don't have anything 
we use the, the singleton. That's kind of the terminal set. Multiplying no sets is not the empty set. It's the terminal set that you may remember with products um, that serves as kind of the unit. Uh, when we go to multiply products, the very thing we start with is one and then we multiply by the first thing. Um, you know, if we want to multiply three and two, we could think of ourselves as taking one and multiplying by three and then multiplying by two. You may remember back a few lectures ago when we first introduced wiring diagrams, it was session 22 of our class, we, um, we actually talked about kind of there's this ether and there's this monoidal unit floating around. Um, you could think of it as appearing anywhere because when you multiply by it, it, it doesn't change anything. So when we multiply things, we're starting with one, as it were. We're starting with singleton, not empty set. So if there's no inputs, we actually have y to the one still. Um, it's just, it's kind of the singleton set one. If we have no outputs, we would have one here, um, not, not zero. Um, right, so, um, so that's one of the reasons you have this. So, this mapping is a mapping between polynomial functors of the sort we've been talking about. So there's two maps, a map of positions um, and a map of, of exponents um, should be familiar. Um, so the map of positions, well, if you tensor these, remember with tensor, you're multiplying the coefficients so you get AC, coefficient here and B there, so you get ACB. And you're multiplying the exponents, not just adding. If this were multiply, if this were product, you'd be adding the coefficients. This is tensor product. So you're multiplying the coefficients, just like we were here. We're tensoring these, um, multiplying the, co those, the, the exponents. So this is what we have. Uh, being mapped to by. This is the polynomial on the left. This is the polynomial on the right. Um, and it's actually a monomial. You'll notice it, 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 it is that way in general. And, and so there's a mapping of positions, ACB to B here. That's the mapping on positions. We map each of these positions into that, one of the positions there. This is the output that would come um, from, from a state uh, over, over here. And, and then we have a mapping back the other way. So uh, it's a mapping from the exponents here, which are just one, to ABA, to the exponents here on the left but it's contextualized by, it's specific to, we have a separate such mapping for each value of ACB here. Each of these positions, and it maps over to this guy, has a different mapping it can specify back from the thing of the right back to the thing of the left. Um, it's a different mapping of exponents it can use. So, here, we could think of that mapping in the reverse direction from the right to the left, as it were, as ACB cross one, the one is from the Y to ABA. Um, those are our two mappings. Those have been the focus for polynomial functors course lecture three from Topos and for lecture four as well. Um, okay, so, it turns out these wiring diagrams um, all have these symbolic notation. You can just kind of compile them into the symbolic notation. And if you have subsystems within subsystems, you can just tensor them up in this sort of way and get you know, an expression that collapses all those levels of hierarchy down into an expression at the highest level. So that's pretty cool. Um, one thing that's perhaps not obvious is that it turns out that wiring diagrams actually make some distinctions clear that if you look at the typing of it, um, uh, 
isn't that clear without kind of extra annotations or type constructors or what have you. So here we have two systems which have the same basic notation in terms of the typing of the mapping. There's of course a particular mapping which is captured here, but but uh, you know it's it's um, this is the the type of it, uh, and it's a, a squared y. Okay, it's a squared because we have these two outputs a and a, and it's y because we have no inputs. It was that same reason we have y to the one here, no inputs, minuto unit times a squared as inputs. That's what these words are. Um, y and then there's a kind of a one here in front because there's no outputs. And, and so this characterizes a map from this on the left to y because um, we have no inputs and no outputs here. Okay, so that's this wiring diagram has this characterization in terms of the type big of its of it of its mapping of what it represents as a dynamical system. Uh, by contrast, this one also has the same notation, but or the same typing of mapping. But you'll notice it swaps these two. Um, this one actually. You know, this a output A, it's of type A, but it goes to the first or to the lower port of this. The upper port on the left goes to the lower port on the right. And the lower port on the left goes to the upper port on the right. Whereas this one, the upper went to upper, lower went to lower. Oh man. Oh man. Okay. So these two have the same notation, but they're different as a wiring diagram. Why diagrams can clue us in to actually added details that are not obvious. Of course, when you have to specify this mapping, um, the one here will be different from the one here, but it's not obvious from its type, from its symbolic notation, that's the case. Here it is obvious. It narrows it down a little bit. What's the, the implementation? This one captures additional richness of typing information as you might capture with type constructors or by annotating it in the way that they do with those little um, set notation, um, just to keep track of you know what's coming from what. Um, okay. Uh, another notation that David introduces in this, uh, I don't think we have time to talk about here in detail, but it's this notion of typed finite sets and. Um, and here we have um, uh, we have a mapping from um, basically each of these boxes um, can be told what it can take inputs from what, whence it can take inputs, uh, and it turns out you can kind of illustrate the connectivity of this diagram and in fact illustrate its equations by sort of saying what feeds what. So like why out here, um, why out the outer, outer one is fed by uh, here x, x out two, it's fed by x out two. So this kind of goes in the opposite direction of data flow. Um, X in one here, um, X in one, uh, which would be uh, this one here, the A is fed by X out one. And so there's some rules here about what has to feed what in these wiring diagrams. Outputs can be fed by outputs of internal things. Um, uh, inputs on internal things could be, can come from, outputs of internal things or inputs to the whole thing. And it turns out this can be characterized with the lens. So, um, sorry, a prism. This is a prism actually. So we have lenses to capture updates of dynamical system and we have prisms in the, the optics context to sort of capture these relationships. Um, 
these relationships of um, what depends on what. So we'll come back to this next time and talk more about this. So for next time, I'd like you to look at lecture four of the Topos Institute course. And I may ask you to, to read sections 3.3 and 3.4 in that book. Okay. Um, so it's on, Cheyenne and I are gonna meet with John Buys today. Uh, we are having a meeting on scientific modeling group. If anyone's interested, um, it's really focused on epidemiological modeling of, with category theory. And last time we had a presentation by William Waits of Law London School of Tropical Hygiene and Medicine on kind of a rule-based characterization of, of basically a sort of an ABM dynamics where you could sort of say what can combine with what and, and by delineating these rules, they could simulate the, the combination of different um, sort of agents as it were to yield other, other agents. So uh, that's this afternoon. If anyone's interested in coming, let me know and, and uh, I'll send you the, uh, the URL to use. It's a, it's a good group uh, from uh, Topos, from Seattle and from, um, uh, from over in, in UK. Okay, uh, and micro, yeah, Microsoft and University of Washington in the Seattle area. Okay, thanks very much. And I look forward to seeing you, I think at a lab meeting uh, later this week or by Friday. Take care of there.